Hi everyone, welcome to lecture number three of this lecture series on linear algebra. In this lecture, I'd like to talk about linear systems of equations, or systems of linear equations, I should say. So let's start by just writing out um, an example of a system. So a linear system of m equations in n unknowns. the form, and so our equation is going to look something like alpha 1 1 x 1 plus alpha 1 2 x 2 plus alpha 1 3 x 3, etc. up to alpha uh, 1 n x n, and this is going to equal beta 1, or it's b 1, sorry, it could be beta, but I wrote b, so we'll go with b's. And so the idea here is that the alphas are real numbers, the x's are the unknowns, there's n of the x's, they're unknowns, and then these, this, to be an equation, there needs to be a number on the right-hand side, so uh, b1 is also a real number. And this is just one equation, right, but we said that in the definition here that we're going to have m equations in n unknowns. So the m equations mean we need more of these equations, right, and we're going to have a total of m of these. And we're going to label these in such a way that then the nth equation, so this is the first equation, has a alpha 1 and then 1 for the first uh, variable here, or the first coefficient. And then alpha 1 means first equation, second coefficient here. So alpha 1, 2 is the second coefficient. Alpha 1, 3 is first equation, third coefficient, etc. And so down here we're going to have an alpha m1 x1 plus alpha m2 x2 all the way up to alpha m n x n, and this will equal b m. All right, and so these are going to be all b equations. And so th this is then a system of m linear equations. So the linear means, right, that all these coefficients are real numbers, and uh, the n unknowns is the x's are the unknowns, right? So in this scenario, all of the alpha i j, so all these alphas, are going to be real numbers. All of the b's are also going to be real numbers. Um, so we'll call them b sub k. These are also real numbers, right? And then the x, um, where are we? I guess we'll have to call these xl's, right? So the x's, the x's are uh, unknowns. Alright, so the x's are going to be unknown. So we'll be given the alphas, we'll be given the b's, and our job is to find the x's in this scenario. Alright, so can we find the x's in this scenario? Um, this is our job. So let, let's write down an example, and then we'll talk about how we can try to solve systems like this, but it's possible um, that, we can, that we can solve them, right? So here's a first example with an actual concrete system of linear equations that we can uh, actually solve. There's no numbers here yet, right? This is just an abstract representation. So here's an example. Let's say we have 3x1 plus 2x2 plus uh, x3 equals 1. There's one equation. The next equation will have x2 minus x3 equals 2. And then the last equation will just be 2x3 equals 4. And this satisfies the definition of the system of linear equations because we have three equations and we have three unknowns. So this is a system of three equations and three unknowns. All of the coefficients are real numbers. These ones that are missing, right, we could write these in as 0x1, right, and then down here 0x1 plus 0x2 if we wanted to or if we needed to, but putting in those extra zeros shows us that, yeah, okay, um, that th this this system right here that we wrote down does fit the same form as the general form that we wrote up above. All right, this is actually a very special form of a system of linear equations <clears throat> because it's in what we call strict triangular form. And, and the red that I've drawn here, these extra zeros, kind of show that, right? They look like a triangle, and then everything that's left on this side kind of looks like a triangle, right? So this is said to be in, in strict triangular form. And the benefit of this is going to be clear in a second. So strict triangular form. 
And so just visually, we can see what strict triangular form means, right? That we have this shape of this triangle right here. Um, but the actual definition is the following. So a system, I'm just going to say a system, but a system of linear equations, right, is said to be in strict linear form. This is what we're defining. If and only if in the kth equation, the coefficients of the first k minus 1 variables are all 0, and the coefficient of the kth variable is not 0. All right, so notice here the, um, this is the first equation, so the first 0, k minus 1, 0 uh, coefficients are 0, and then the, the next one is not. So maybe we'll go down to the third equation, right? The third equation, the first two are zero, and then the third one is not. All right, so let me finish writing. I said this, but I didn't finish writing it. But in the kth equation, the first k minus one coefficients are zero. So again, third equation, the first k minus one. So the first two are zero, and then the third one is not zero. All right, and the kth is not zero. And this is, so this is a definition that will get us um, our, what we call our strict triangular form. And again, why is this useful? Why do we care about our strict triangular form? Well, now what we can do is we can use a method called back solving to actually solve for these unknowns. The x1, x2, and x3, those are unknowns, okay? So we can now use back substitution or back solving. to solve for the unknowns. All right, and let's just see how this works. So let's take this equation, start at the bottom. This one just has one unknown, right? This equation has only one unknown. So if we write down 2x3 equals 4, well then obviously dividing through, x3 better be 2, right? Once we know that, we can plug that into the next step up. And we can use that information to solve this next equation, right? So we know that x3 is 2. Let's write this out. x2 minus x3 is equal to 2. That's our, that's our second equation. But we know that x3 is 2. So we have x2 minus 2, right, equals 2. And so now, of course, we just add this over. And x2 must be equal to 4. And now we see how this works, right? Now we take that information and we step up to this top equation the first equation. And so this one says 3x1 plus 2x2 plus x3, that's equal to 1, all right? But we can use the information that we have from these other ones. So we have 3x1 plus 2 times x2. Uh, x2 is 4, right, from our previous work. And then plus x3, x3 is going to be 2. And this is all supposed to equal 1. And so from there, we can solve for this unknown, right? And so what do we have over here? We have um, 8, 10, so we just subtract, right? So this is going to say then 3x1 is equal to minus 9, and so x1 is going to be equal to negative 3. All right, so now uh, we need to write out our solution to the system of equations. <laughs> All right, so now the solution of the system of equations, we just want to write out as an ordered triple. And so this ordered triple is just going to be x1, x2, x3, right? So the solution, I'll try to get this all on one screen here, but the solution, solution of the system is this, x1, x2, x3. This ordered triple in this case, it's a triple because this was uh, three unknowns, right? But it's going to just be this, answer. So negative 3, comma 4, comma 2. So the order triple. So that's the solution. Uh, that's the only set of x1, x2, x3 that solves this linear equation. All right, so it's pretty straightforward uh, when the system is given to us in triangular form. If the system is given to us in non-triangular form, right, if it's not in this strict triangular form, uh, then one of the methods that we're going to use to solve these systems is to try to get it into strict triangular form. So that's what we'll do next here. Let me just draw a divider. This is going to be item three. So um, here's our example, our next example. 
we want to try to solve this system of linear equations. So x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 is equal to 3. The next equation is going to be 3x1 minus x2 minus 3x3 equals negative 1. And then the last equation, we're going to do three equations, three unknowns again. So it's going to be similar to the last one. But this one's going to be 2x1 plus 3x2 plus x3 equals 4. And we want to try to solve the system. So again, solving the system means finding the ordered triple that for which the, the th three numbers, x1, x2, x3, th those numbers solve all three equations at the same time. So they're a solution to all three equations at the same time. Now, uh, what we're going to use are um, the, you know, rules of solving equations that we know from, from an algebra course, right? So what can we do to an equation without changing it? Well, <clears throat> the first thing that we can do is we can obviously change the order of these equations. Uh, that's not going to change anything for us, right? But to get it into triangular form, we, that might be useful, right? So if we want to make this look like triangular form, we can change the order of the equations. That literally doesn't change anything but the way that the system looks, right? The second thing that we can do is we can always multiply one equation, uh, any equation, by a non-zero number. As long as we don't multiply by zero, right? Zero would cancel out the whole equation, but we can multiply uh, the entire equation by the same constant, right? Um, and it will not change the, the answer of the equation, the solution of the equation. So we can multiply by a non-zero constant. And when I say multiply, I mean multiply a single equation, right? So this is just done for a single equation. And then the third thing that we can do is we can add um, any two equations to create a, another equation, right? And replace one of them by that the, the sum equation. So if we can add and we can multiply by a number, then actually what we can do is we can replace any equation by the sum of itself, right, with a constant multiple of another equation. So these are what we're allowed to do just from our knowledge of, of basic algebra, what we're allowed to do to solve this system, right? So why don't you guys take a moment and try to uh, work through this and when you come back I will I will show you how, how it's done. <music>guys now that you're back uh, I'd like to work through this together hopefully you got the answer but let's let's check and see uh, how this goes so here I just copied this equation so that I can uh, manipulate it a little bit the system of equations so we want to try to get this into triangular form by using these operations right so we want ours to eventually we want it to look like this up here so let's see how we can do this the first step is going to be that we want to um, get rid of these coefficients, right? So our job is going to be to kind of zero out this lower left triangle if possible. So we want to kind of zero out this lower left triangle. So here's what we can do. I'm going to name these equations, all right? I'm going to call this equation 1, equation 2, and equation 3. And I want to get rid uh, this. this is right here is fine, right? So I want to get rid of these two. So I'm going to do two steps at once here. But I'm going to do um, equation 2 minus three times equation one, and I'm gonna replace equation two with this new equation. So I'm gonna do this one minus three times this one. That's gonna get rid of this, right? But if I do that to the first term, I'm gonna get rid of the first term. I need to uh, see what happens to the rest of them, right? And at the same time, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do equation three minus two times equation one, and I'm gonna put that back in, in equation three spot. All right, so let's see what happens. Well, the first equation we're not doing anything to, so that's going to stay the same, right? So this will be x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 equals 3. This next one, we're going to do this calculation. So the first term is going to be zeroed out. That's the whole idea, right? 0x1. And then what happens to the rest? Well, we need to work this out. So this one's going to be negative 1x2 minus 6x2. So that's going to end up being minus 7x2. 
And then in the next spot, we have minus 3x3 minus 3x3, right? So that's going to be minus 6x3. And then we also have to do this to the right-hand side of the equation. So this is going to be negative 1 minus 9, right? Negative 1 minus 9. Just make sure that you're multiplying the entire first equation by negative 3. I'm not writing it out because I don't want to change that equation, actually, when I write it down, right? But, so this will be uh, negative 10. All right, now we go to the third equation, and we repeat the same process. So again, we're going to zero out the first coefficient. That's the whole point of this, right? And then we're going to calculate the rest. So this is going to be 3x2 minus 4x2. So that's going to leave us with minus x2. And then this one's going to be 1x3 minus 2x3. So that's going to be negative x3 or minus x3. And then we have 4 minus 6, so that's going to be a minus 2. All right, and so we've changed our system to... Uh, this new form, right? And by the way, we haven't changed the solution at all. And so now we just want to repeat these steps, right? So the next job is to just zero out this one. Um, one thing that we could do is, if you don't like these negative signs, that everything in the second equation is negative and everything in this third equation is negative, right? Then before we go any further, we could just swap out equation 2 with its negative, right? Or negative 1 times equation 2. That's allowed by rule number 2. We can do the same thing with equation 3, right? Negative 1 times equation 3. And, you know, you don't have to write out every single step of this, but this is the first time we were doing this process, so we'll write it all out. And then this equation is going to become 7x2 plus 6x3 equals positive 10. I just changed the sign. Same thing here, right? So x2 plus x3 equals positive 2. Okay, and at this point, uh, actually, another thing that I want to do is I would like to, just because I think it's going to be easier for us to eliminate um, from this one, let's swap these two. All right, so then after we've done all this, I'm going to swap rows two and three. All right, and we'll see why in a second, just because it's going to be easier for us. So I'm going to just move these. All right, so there's, again, our system with the same solution. So we haven't changed any of the solutions. And now at this point, I want to get rid of this one. So I'm going to take row 3. So after we change all the signs, right, I didn't want to mess this up. But I'm going to take row, the new row 3 and subtract 7 times the new row 2. I'm going, to, I'm going to put that back in row 3. Okay, and that's going to get rid of this, right? So that's going to get rid of this. So let's see this final result. Then we're going to have our triangular form, right? So let's see how this goes. I'm going to write it down here now. Our first equation, we haven't done anything to this equation the whole time. So that equation has stayed the same. This one's done. Uh, x2 plus x3 equals 2. And our new equation, x3, is going to have 0x2s. Again, that's the point, right? That's the point. We're going to zero out the x2. And then we have to figure out what happens to the rest of this, right? So. This is going to be 6x3 minus 7x3, so that's going to be minus x3. And then this is going to be 10 minus 14, right? Make sure that you multiply this negative, this 7 times the entire equation. So 10 minus 14, so this will be negative 4. And at this point, we have our strict triangular form, right? Strict tri triangular form. Um, and we can now go through our back solving, okay? So at this point, we've transformed by just using these these properties of algebra, these rules of algebra, we've transformed our system into this strict triangular form, and now we can solve it, like I said. So at this point, we just go quickly, right? So what do we get? x3 is equal to positive 4, okay? And so then this one can be solved, and we can say x2 is going to be 2 minus x3, so x2 is going to be 2 minus 4, so that's going to be negative 2, right? And then we go up to x1. Well, x1 is going to be 3 minus 2x2 minus x3. It's x1. I'm just moving these over, right? So x1 is going to be 3 um, plus 4 minus 2 times negative 2. So plus 4 minus 4. So this is 3. All right, and our solution is the following x1 x2 x3 notice i'm writing in order the ordered pair of the unknowns right and then writing the solution and make sure you get them in the right order so this is then 3 minus 2 
4. Okay, so there's our solution. So, by the way, um, as we went along here, we made these, uh, what we called, we, we, we did these operations to the equations, right, to the, the individual equations, and then a few times we combined the equa equations, many times actually, by multiplying um, a constant times one equation and then adding or subtracting it from, from another row um, or from another equation. And it resulted in a system that we did not change the answer as we went, right? And so all of these are actually individually are systems of equations in their own right. And they all look different, right? And so they're all technically different systems of equations, but they all have the same solution or solution set, you might say. And so therefore, uh, they're called equivalent systems. So we every arrow that we've drawn here, so that maybe there should be like a green arrow down here. Every arrow that we've made a transformation of our system, we've transformed from one system to an equivalent system. And that process has preserved our solution down here. And so eventually we were able to get our solution. Okay? All right, so the next thing that we want to do is try to streamline this process. This process is exactly how we're going to solve these uh, moving forward. But um, we don't necessarily want to or need to, as long as we arrange this in kind of in columns, right, where the unknowns are lined up in columns like this, which every at every step I did that, right, I made sure that the x1s were in this column, the x2s were in this column, x3s are all in this column, then what really matters, as long as we agree to keep this organization, right, what really matters are the coefficients. So the coefficients are what really matter. And so what we can do is we can arrange the coefficients in what's called an augmented matrix, or just a matrix. All right. So um, let's just call this item here, augmented matrices and elementary row operations. All right, so let's suppose that we have a system of linear equations. I'm going to write this out symbolically like we did the first one. So we're going to have m equations and n unknowns. So it's going to look like alpha 1, 1, x1 plus alpha 1, 2, x2 all the way up to alpha 1, n, x, n. And this is going to equal some b1. All right, and again, we have then alpha 2, 1, x1, uh, plus, I'll write a few more of these, but alpha 2, 2, x2, alpha 2n, xn, this is going to be equal to b2. And this whole process is going to continue until we get to alpha m1, x1, alpha m2, x2. There's our m equations, right? And then we get over to our alpha mn, xn, that's going to equal bm. All right, and so this is our generic system of m equations and n unknowns. Again, the alphas are all known, the b's are all known, the x's are what needs to be solved for, right? Um, so we can arrange these in two, two different kinds of what are called matrices, okay? So the first thing is going to be the coefficient matrix. A matrix just means like an array or an arrangement of, of in this case, it's going to be numbers. All right, but the coefficient matrix, I think it'll be clear when I write it out. The coefficient matrix, we're going to call this A for this system. All right, so this is specific to this system. Is So this is the matrix A, all right? And, and again, a matrix is just an arrangement. Sometimes we wrap them in pr giant parentheses just so that we can... Uh, just so that we can kind of see that they're all together, right, in this array. And it's just going to be um, the arrangement of coefficients taken in order. So we're just going to take all these coefficients, and we've already arranged everything by in columns, like we just talked about, right? We've already arranged everything in columns based on um, the equations themselves and the unknowns of the equations itself. And so we're just going to pick out these constants. We're going to pick out these constants. So our... Um, our coefficient matrix is going to be alpha 1, 1, alpha 1, 2, all the way over to alpha 1n in the first row. And then it's going to be arranged, so the next row is alpha 2, 1, alpha 2, 2, all the way over to alpha 2n. Just take the coefficients, and it's going to continue down to alpha m1, 
alpha m2, alpha mn. All right, and so then we just get this array. This is going to have m rows and n columns, and these are just going to be the coefficients, right? So we're going to call this an m by n matrix. This means we have m rows and n columns. And it corresponds exactly to how we uh, wrote down, how we organized our system of equations, right? So the first column, this corresponds to all the coefficients on the x1 variable. The second column corresponds to all the coefficients on the x2 variable, etc., right? And so that's the coefficient matrix. But which this is important and by itself is important and we're going to work with this as we move forward in the semester. We're going to work with just this coefficient matrix by itself uh, frequently. But notice that we also have these over, these values over here that will be known, right? So we don't have equations without these. So if we just have coefficients, then we don't have equations, right? So these uh, B values, these are going to be known numbers, remember? They, they represent the right-hand sides of our equations. Um, those numbers have to be factored into this matrix if we're going to be able to use it to solve our system of equations, right? And so what we do is then we, we can make an augmented matrix. So we'll call these two things. So the vector of right-hand sides. So we'll call this one a vector, but this is still a matrix, okay? So this is uh, B. We'll draw a line over it. But this is just going to be a, a matrix that has one column, all right, just one column. So this is going to be B1, B2, down to BM. So this, in, in our notation here, this is actually, I called it a vector, right? Um, but it's not the same sense of a, it's not an abstract vector in the sense that we've been studying. All right, uh, this, term, this usage of the term vector just means that we have an M by one matrix. All right, so again, M rows, but only one column. That's it, all right, just one column. Now, you, you, we could also call this a vector if it was uh, one row and M or N columns, um, but that would be a column, that would be a row, that would make it a row, right? Um, just a row array. We want this to be a vertical array because what we're going to do then is we're going to make the augmented matrix for the system, and this is the key here. So what we're augmenting is the coefficient matrix. We're, all we're going to do is add a column to this thing that represents this uh, right-hand sides, right, the vector B. So the augmented matrix for the system is then given by, I'm going to write this two ways, so this is key. So it's going to be given by this notation. So it's going to be our coefficient matrix A, and then we're going to draw a vertical line, which in terms of the system of equations is going to represent the equal signs somehow. It's going to remind us that we have these equal signs. And then we'll put our vector B here, right? But as a full matrix, what does this look like? And, and the, the vertical line here is just decorations, really. Um, it's just a decoration. But what this is going to look like then is alpha 1, 1, alpha 1, 2, all the way over to alpha 1, n, vertical line, then B1 is going to be over here, all right? Same thing with the second row, alpha uh, 2, 1, alpha 2, 2, all the way to alpha 2, n, and then B2 is going to be over here, all right? Then down to alpha M1, alpha M2, all the way over to alpha M, n, B, M is going to be over here. All right, and that's our augmented matrix for our system. This now encodes the entire system because it's got all the coefficients organized in order, right? It's got a vertical line that reminds us that we have an equal sign, and then it's got the all the right-hand sides lined up with their appropriate equation, right? And so we can then use this. So this can be then be used to kind of uh, help us streamline this whole process of triangulating. There's there's a name for this, which we'll, I'll give you the name in a minute. Um, but for triangulating the system, all right? So this can be used to solve our system now. And that's the key because, um, number one, it's hard to type unknowns into a computer. So if you're thinking about, can I use a computer to help me do this? It's, you know, the X's, all these symbolic things. There are computer languages that will allow you to do it, but it becomes more tedious, right? If we can just arrange this array of numbers and then do something to those numbers, then, then we're good to go, right? It's going to be much easier. 
Um, so what are we allowed to do? Well, all of these things that we were allowed to do to our equations themselves, we can now do to the rows of our augmented matrix, as long as we do it to an entire row of our matrix, right? These are called elementary row operations. And this is, this is going to be key, because these are going to be all the things we're allowed to do. So elementary row operations. And these are going to be, again, exactly the same as what we wrote down up above of things that we were allowed to do to the equations in a system of equations. So type 1 elementary row operations. Type 1 up above was that we could multiply an equation, or sorry, we could switch uh, the order, right? We could switch the order of any two of the equations in our, in our list of equations. So now what does that mean? That means that we can swap any two rows, okay, or interchange any two rows. This is going to be our type 1. interchange any two rows of the matrix. So this can be done to any kind of matrix, by the way, um, but we're going to do it to, uh, to these augmented matrices. So type 2, the next uh, type of operation, th that was the one that we said we could multiply any equation by a non-zero constant, right? Well, remember, every row of our augmented matrix represents an equation, right? So this means that we can multiply any row of our matrix by a non-zero constant, as long as we multiply the whole row, right? So multiply by a non-zero constant. And then finally, our type 3 operation was that we could add uh, any two equations and replace one of them. So we can do the same thing, right? So we can replace any row by the sum of itself with a constant multiple of another row. Okay, so these are the elementary row operations. We will use these throughout the semester. These apply to any matrix. Now that we've written down, you know, we kind of have given a heuristic definition at least of what a matrix is. Um, it, it's the kind of the only definition. It's an array of numbers, right? Um, in this case, these numbers have meaning. They represent uh, coefficients of, of equations. Um, but let's see how we can now use this process, this matrix uh, method, to solve a system of equations. So let's do another example. So uh, this is going to be item number five. We want to solve the system. So I'm going to give us a system here. So this system is going to be x1 uh, plus 2x2 minus 2x3 equals 1. Then 2x1, the next equation, plus 5x2 plus x3 equals 9. And then the last equation is going to be x1 plus 3x2 plus 4x3 equals 9. All right? So I want to solve this system by first. So by first, let's write the augmented matrix then use these row operations to triangulate it so use elementary row operations to get this in strict triangular form And then finally, um, then rewrite the new system and back solve, or and solve it by back sub. All right, so I'll give you a minute. Try to do this on your own first, and then uh, when you're done, we can take a look at it together. Okay, now that you've had a chance to work that one out yourself, let's try to look at it together. So the first step, uh, if you follow these instructions that I've given, is to write down the augmented matrix. So the augmented matrix, remember, just picks out the coefficients and lines them up in an array, right? So this one's going to be 1, 
2, negative 2, and then here's my vertical line dividing, and then 1 on this side. Then it's going to be 2, 5, 1, 9 for the next row. And the last row is going to be 1, 3, 4, 9, right? Okay, and remember our goal is to, uh, if we're trying to get this in strict triangular form, then our goal is to get these to be zeros, right? We want to zero out that lower triangle down there and make the upper portion that's, that's kind of to the left of our vertical line, we want to make that be um, a, the triangle. That's the triangle. That's the strict triangle, right? So we can't do all this at once. So what we'll do is we'll start with trying to zero out these guys, right? So we'll do kind of similar to what we did before. We're going to take uh, row 2, and we are going to subtract uh, 2 times row 1 and put that back in row 2. Right? So row 2 minus 2 row 1, that'll get rid of this. And then we're going to do the same thing. Row 3 minus row 1, replace row 3. And then we just rewrite our augmented matrix. We're not going to change the first row. So 1, 2, minus 2. Here's our vertical divider. There's a 1. We're going to change everything else though, right? So in this process, we're going to zero out these two. That's the whole idea. That's, that's where these operations, that's what these operations are telling us to do, right? Um, but everything else we have to work out. So this one's going to be 5 minus 2 times 2. So 5 minus 4 is 1. This is going to be 1 minus 2 times negative 2. So 1 plus 4, that's 5. And then this one's going to be 9 minus 2. So that's just 7, right? Then we go down to this last one. This one's going to be 3 minus 2, right? So R3 minus R1, just straight, straight up. Uh, so 3 minus 2, that's 1. This is 4 minus negative 2, so that's going to become a 6. And then 9 minus 1 is 8. All right. And then to get this into our strict triangular form, the next thing is we need to get rid of this, right? We need to zero, not get rid of, but zero out this coefficient. So this one's going to be done by taking row 3, subtract row 2, and replace row 3. All right, and that's the only operation we have to do. That's going to zero out this, and then we just, you know, live with whatever happens after that, right? Um, so again, we're not going to change anything in rows 1 or 2 on this one. We're going to leave rows 1 and 2 the same. So 1, 2, negative, just make sure at this point that you copy everything correctly every time, right? So 1, 2, negative 2, 1. Then this is going to be 0, 1, 5, 7. This is going to be 0 because we've got two zeros here, so that's done, right? That's why we'd go in this order, by the way, because now whatever we do to these two rows is not going to affect our first column here, right? It's going to leave those as zeros as long as we only involve these two. So that's still going to be zero. And then our job was to zero out this, right? So that's going to be done. And then we just subtract. So 6 minus 5 is 1. 8 minus 7 is 1. All right. And so now this is in strict triangular form. So if we follow the instructions again, so there's like the first step of the instructions, then we want to rewrite the system. So we want to then take this matrix and rewrite our system of equations. Now it's going to be a new system. It's going to be an equivalent system, right? So the new system is going to be x1 plus 2x2 minus 2x3 equals 1. That equation actually didn't change, right? But the rest did because this one's now going to say x2 plus 5x3 equals 7, and this one just says x3 equals 1. Well, look at that one's done, right? So this is this is our, the next step was to use back substitution. Well, there we go. We've got that, right? So now we move this up here. This one now says x2 is equal to 7 minus 5 times 1. So that's 7 minus 5, so that's 2. So our x2 is 2. And then we take both of these and plug them into this one, right? So this one's going to say x1 is equal to 1 uh, minus 2 times x2. x2 is 2. Plus 2, I'm moving these over, right? So plus 2 times x3, that's our 1. All right, so this is 1 minus 4 plus 2. So that's going to be negative 1, right? 1 minus 4 plus 2. And so at the very end, we just give our solution. Clearly identify our solution. x1, x2, x3. All right, it's going to be the ordered triple, ordered negative, this one first, right? Negative 1, 2, 1. And there we go. There's the solution of the system 
done using our augmented matrix. All right, so now everything that we've done can be summarized with a couple of definitions here. And these are going to be kind of the key to everything moving forward. So this is item six. But yeah, we can, we can summarize these into two ideas, which are called uh, row echelon form and reduced row echelon form. So um, we'll write this, we'll title this one as follows. So reduced row echelon form. And so here are, is our first definition. We'll start with this definition and I'll write down some examples and then we'll try to uh, use this process to solve some equations going forward. We, we actually just used um, the row echelon form, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Let me, let me write it out first. So a matrix, any matrix, okay, is said to be in row echelon form or just REF, because that's a lot to write every time, right? But row echelon form, if the following properties are satisfied, and these are gonna be a little bit wordy, but I'll write down some examples and we'll see exactly what it means here. But there's three properties that we have to uh, obey here. So the first non-zero entry of every row has to be a one from left to right. When I say first, everything's gonna be from left to right. So the first non-zero entry of each row is a one. All right, so from left to right, again, it starts with a bunch of zeros possibly, but then there's a one, that's the first non-zero. The second property is if row K has, um, so if row K does not, sorry, if row K does not consist of all zeros, all right, then the number of leading zeros in row k plus 1, so then the number of leading zero entries in the next row down. So we're counting uh, the entries in each row from left to right, and the rows are ordered down from top to bottom. All right, so the number of leading zero entries in row k plus 1, that's the next one right, is greater than the number of leading zeros in row K. So this just means that as you work down, there's more zeros in the front, right? Um, so it's greater than the number of zero entries in row K. Like I said, it's wordy, but we'll, we'll draw some examples here. And then finally, if there are rows that have all zeros, then they let, they fall at the bottom of, of the matrix. So if there are rows consisting of all zeros, so they lie below from top to bottom, um, the rows that have non-zeros. All right, like I said, this is pretty wordy. Let's just write down some examples here. Uh, actually, our first example is this one, right? This, this uh, result of our operations up here ended up being in row echelon form. All of the rows, as you read from left to right, all of the rows, their first non-zero entry from left to right is a one, right? So there we go, that's satisfied. And then um, as you work your way down, each row has progressively more leading zeros, right? So this one doesn't have any leading zeros. This one has one leading zero. And this one has two leading zeros. And there are no rows with all zeros, so that, that part doesn't apply, right? But this one is in row echelon form. Let's write down some other examples, because these don't, they can look a little, they look like that in general, but they can look a little bit different. So um, I'm just writing down an example here. But this, this matrix is in row echelon form. It's, it's almost exactly the same as what we just wrote down, right? Um, you have this cascading ones along the diagonal, you have zeros below the diagonal. So that's row echelon form. But it can also, you can also get something like this. So you could have, say, a full row on top, and then zero, zero, one, and then this to be in row echelon form would have to be all zeros in the bottom row. But this is row echelon form that obeys the rules. All right, and then finally you could have something 
um, like this even. So it could look like maybe something like this. So there, you skip one each time, right? You skip a, a, a column each time. So two zeros, then four zeros, leading zeros. So these are all in row echelon form. All right. Um, the next definition is going to be reduced row echelon form. So a matrix is said to be in reduced row echelon form. And that we're going to call RREF, reduced row echelon form, if the following are satisfied. And so again, two properties. These are easier to write down. So first of all, the matrix must be in row echelon form. So that's the easiest, right? The matrix is already in REF, row echelon form. And then number two, though, is that um, the first non-zero in entry in any, in any row is the only non-zero entry. All right, and the second property is that the first non-zero entry in every row is the only non-zero entry in its column. So this is the key here. This is, makes it reduced. So it's the only non-zero entry in its column. All right, so let's see how this looks and see how it's different. So first of all, let's just do a simple two by two. Uh, reduced row echelon form would make this be like um, one, zero, zero, one. So these things, the first, this is row echelon form. It's almost too simple, right? But this is row echelon form and the, uh, the ones are the only non-zero entries in their column. So it's almost too simple. Let's do a little bit more complicated one. Maybe something like this. Um, so in this case, the rows are not all, you know, zeros after the ones, but in each column, the only non-zero entry in these first three columns is a one. And this is in row echelon form, right? It's in reduced row echelon form because of these zeros. So these zeros up here are what make it reduced row echelon form. And there's nothing that can be done with these, right? So these are just, these are not the first non-zero entry in any of their rows. So they just have to hang around, all right? Reduced row echelon form could also look like something like this. You can have your all zeros um, and then it's possible. So this row right here doesn't have any ones. So it's not, this is this two up here is not the first non-zero entry in its row. And so this uh, item number two doesn't apply to this column, right? Um, so yeah, there's a, another possibility could look something like this. So there's a column with two non-zero entries, right? Two non-zero entries. But again, this is not the first non-zero entry in its row for either one of them. So these are these are all now in what's called reduced row echelon form or RREF. Okay, um, we wanna use RREF to actually solve our systems of equations now. So we're gonna use, uh, we wanna get these matrices in RREF or augmented matrices in RREF. So this whole process gets a name, really two names, but here's our definitions. The act of solving a system of linear equations using an augmented matrix and either of these forms has a name. So if you use just REF, uh, this is called 
Gaussian or Gaussian elimination. After the mathematician Gauss, so this is called Gaussian, sometimes pronounced Gaussian elimination. All right, and if you use RREF, then this is called Gauss Jordan elimination. So another mathematician gets some credit for this one. So REF, RREF. All right, so what I would like to do then is give you guys a chance. I'm going to write down a system. This is going to be a system of three equations and five unknowns. Um, and I would like you to try your best to at least get started to use Gauss-Jordan elimination. All right, to try to solve this equation. So there's x4, x5 equals 2. So this first equation is x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 4 plus x5 equals 2. That's it, all right? The next equation is going to be x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus 2x4 plus 2x5. That's all going to equal 3. And then the last one is going to be x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus 2x4 plus 3x5. This is going to equal 2. All right, so I would like you guys to try to solve this, at least get started. Solve this using Gauss-Jordan elimination. So in other words, write the augmented matrix, get it in, um, get the augmented matrix in reduced row echelon form, and then you can go back and use back substitution if necessary. Okay, so I'll give you a moment to start that, and then we'll meet up and finish it up together. All right, now that you've had a chance to work on that, let's work on it together now. Let's start by writing out our augmented matrix. So the matrix is going to look like a whole bunch of ones in this first row. Then there's the augmentation line, right? And then the two. The next row is going to be one, 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 two, two, three. And then one, 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 two, three, two. All right, so we want to use elementary row operations on this to get this in reduced row echelon form. So the first things that we can do, uh, these are all, this looks like a block of all the same stuff, right? So we can take uh, row 2 and subtract row 1 and replace row 2. We can do the same thing with row 3, right? Row 3 minus row 1, replace row 3, and that's going to take care of these two. But just by looking at it, it's also going to take care of this whole block, right? because all this whole block is the same. So let's just see what happens as we work this out. We're going to leave the first row the same, unchanged. The next row, as we do our subtraction, we're going to get 0. Here, I'll color code it. We're going to get 0, 0, 0, right? And then we're going to have 1, 1, 1. OK, the next row, again, 0, 0, 0. There's a bunch of leading zeros, and then it's going to be 1, 2, 0 in this, this one, right? 1, 2, 0. All right, and we are not in row echelon form yet. So the next step, not even row echelon, right? The next step is to get rid of this. So now we're going to do row 3 minus row 2, and we're going to replace row 3. And again, because we've zeroed out all these terms, it's not going to affect any of these. These are going to stay zeros, right? They're going to remain as zeros. And let's see what happens. I think I have room to get this matrix written over here. So again, the first row remains unchanged. Now the second row is going to also remain unchanged. The third row is going to become 0, 0, 0. The whole point is to get this to be 0, right? And then we subtract. So 2 minus 1 is 1. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. All right? And so now we have REF, row echelon form. But this is not reduced row echelon form. So it's not reduced because we need to now get rid of this stuff, right? So this needs to be dealt with to make it RREF. Well. How are we going to get rid of these? We can kind of now do the same process that we just did backwards, right? So now that we've zeroed out all of this bottom corner, we can use row 3 to get rid of these guys, right? 
So we can use our row operations kind of work back up. So now what we can do is we can take row 1 and we can subtract uh, row 3 and this time replace row 1. All right, because of all these zeros, it's only going to work on this last spot, right? And then we can do the same thing with row 2. And again, because of all the zeros, it's only going to work on the last spot. So we can take row 2, subtract row 3, and this time replace row 2. This is how we're going to get into reduced row echelon form. All right? So there's my arrow. Remember, every arrow here means that we've done a, a, an operation that has not changed our solution, right? We get an equivalent system. So this time we're going to get, what, 1, 1, 1, 1, four ones. That's going to become a 0 because we're subtracting, right? So that's a 0. And then 2 minus negative 1, that's going to become 3. So with our subtraction, we get that. The next row is going to become 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, right? And then uh, 1 minus negative 1, that's going to become a 2. And then our last row remains. And now we have just one more operation to do. And look at because we've zeroed this out and this out, as we work backwards again, uh, we can now get rid of this term, right, by doing a substitution that way, a row off that way. So now row 1 minus row 2 is only going to change that element, right, because we've got this row to have just a bunch of zeros and a 1. And we're going to replace row 1 again. All right, so this is going to be our last operation because we're going to be in reduced row echelon form after this. 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. That's all by design, right? But now we have to think about this. So row 1 minus row 2, that's going to leave us with just 1, right? 3 minus 2. And then we look at what we've got for the rest of this. And we're going to see why we like reduced row echelon form so much. So now we're in RREF, right? So we're done with this process. Now we need to interpret this, right? So this equation, what does it represent? If we go back through, these columns represented the coefficients, right? The coefficients of our equations, each of our equations. So now the last uh, row represents the equation that says that 0x1 plus 0x2, etc. 1x5 equals negative 1, right? So as we translate this from bottom to top, we get x1 equal, sorry, x1, x5. Just said from bottom to top, right? So this is the x5, 1x5 equals negative 1. That one's done, right? Move up to the next equation. This equation says x4 equals 2, right? And then go back up to the first equation. This one's a little bit more complicated, right? But this one says that x1 plus x2 plus x3 is equal to 1. Okay, so we've got these fixed values for x4 and x5, x1, x2, x3, that's, this is, this is, uh, so the, the issue here is that we didn't have enough equations to actually solve for all five variables, right? So this, this system is said to be underdetermined, which I'll talk about in a minute, but underdetermined because we don't have enough information to solve for all five of the unknowns. So what we can do then is we can say, all right, let's solve this for x1. x1, let's say, is then equal to 1 minus x2 minus x3 and we can then let x2 and x3 be free so these are free variables no restrictions on them but then x1 depends on those right so in other words we can write our solution set as follows so now it's truly going to be a set right so i'll even write it in set notation it's going to be the set of all ordered triples that look like uh, one minus alpha, minus beta, uh, alpha, beta, and then 2, minus 1. And this is for any real numbers, alpha and beta. So what have I just done? I just kind of wrote that out without talking about it enough, right? But what did I do? Well, up here at this point, I said, okay, let's let x2 equal alpha and x3 equal beta, just any real numbers, right? And then from this equation, x1 has to equal 1 minus alpha minus beta. All right, and so then I just took all of these and paired them with these, right, and wrote them as an ordered uh, 5 tuple in this case. So this is the set of all points. So for any alpha and beta, there's two free variables, but for any alpha and beta, points of this form, right, 
ordered five tuples of this form will solve our system, this system right here of equations. Okay, so mostly though, this was to see how the reduced row echelon form works, the Gauss-Jordan elimination. And um, let's finish up this lecture then by just talking about the geometry of our solutions a little bit. And we'll leave it there once we do that. So we are on item eight now. And geometry of our solutions. All right, so let's say um, that we have, so it's possible to have a couple different kinds of systems. So let's just think about in two and three dimensions here, but let's think about in R2. Let's suppose we have a system of two equations. We know what, how, how to deal with just a single equation, right? But two equations, two linear equations, and two unknowns. Well, why do we call them linear equations? Well, their graphs in two dimensions are lines, right? So let's suppose we have two equations. Again, two unknowns because we're in R2. So we'll have something like alpha 1, 1, x1 plus alpha 1, 2, x2 equals b1, and then alpha 2, 1, x1 plus alpha 2, 2, x2 equals b2. And so how, what is this going to look like, right? Well, each one of these equations represents a line in two-dimensional space. So our x2 and our x1 coordinate systems. So let's say maybe this one represents, say, this line. I'm just, you know, making this up so that we can see the geometry. And let's say this one equals, say, this line. So each, again, each equation represents a line. And what's the solution going to be? The algebraic solution that we get by doing, say, Gauss-Jordan elimination is going to end up being the representing the ordered pair. So it's going to be the ordered pair that represents the uh, intersection of these two, right? So if this is A and this is B, then our solution would be x1, x2 equals A, B. So we're looking, and geometrically, all we're doing is looking for the intersection of two lines, right? Two lines in the plane, when you have a system of two equations and two unknowns. But it doesn't always happen, right? So there's three possibilities, actually. So there's three possibilities. So one possibility is that we get exactly what we've just drawn here, right? So we get exactly one solution. And this is what happened for the first few examples that we that we did, right? So one solution. So this looks like the lines intersect. All right, and that's exactly this picture. So I'll just redraw this very quickly. But our lines could intersect. And again, in this case, there's the point. The intersection point is the solution that we're looking for. All right. Possibility number two, though, is that the lines are parallel, right? So that would that would end up giving us no solution. Parallel lines do not intersect. So again, lines are parallel. So it's possible then we get no solution, right? So in your system of equations, if you're doing this just purely algebraically, what you would end up with is some kind of equation that ends up being like nonsense. So the, the key to this in your in your reduction, in your RREF, or your REF, you would get a line that might look like um, something like 0, 0, augment 2 or something. So 0x1 plus 0x2 equals 2. That, that's, cut, that's nonsense, right? So that can't happen. And so in that case, that tells you that the lines must be parallel, and so therefore um, no solution. And then the third possibility, though, is that the lines act, the two equations actually represent the same line. So uh, that would give us infinitely many solutions. Every point would be a every point on the line would be a solution. Not every point, but every point on the line. So these would represent the same line. All right, so again, if we're just thinking of these as lines, maybe the first equation represents this line. Second equation represents the same line. Then every point on the line is a solution. All right, and so this would happen in your in your REF if you get something like uh, one. I'll call it alpha, b 
beta and then zero zero zero. So if you're if you're reduced your reduction looks something like this for a two by two system, right? Um, then this is what you would have. Notice that notice the difference, right? So the bottom row in with no solution looks like zero zero two or three or anything, right? Anything is not zero. But if you have zero zero zero, then you actually have infinitely many solutions. All right, so um, here's some definitions then. So now we know that it's possible that our, our system could have one solution, no solutions, or infinitely many solutions. The same is true, by the way, for any, um, any what we'll call a square system. So n equations in n-dimensional space. n equations in n-dimensional space. All right, so here's a definition. A, any system now, but a system of linear equations... is said to be consistent if it has at least one solution. All right, and then it's obviously called inconsistent if it has no solution. All right, so we say that our system of equations is consistent if it has a solution, inconsistent if it has no solution. All right, let's, uh, before, so th that's the definition that applies to any system. But let's look at three-dimensional space uh, really quickly. Well, before we do that, l let's consider this idea. I'm just going to write another definition, then we'll consider all these ideas and we'll call it after that. But um, it's possible that we had we had an example up here where we didn't have enough information, right? So we have five unknowns, but we only had three equations. This system is called underdetermined, so there's not enough um, equations to actually get a a, a a one a single solution, right, to our system. So I'll write it this way: a system. So let me let me do this with some letters here, but an M by n system. So this means m equations in n unknowns. This is said to be underdetermined underdetermined if m is less than n. So if there's not as many equations as there are unknowns, then we have an underdetermined system. In this case, then what's going on? So let's think about this situation in three-dimensional space now. So in three-dimensional space, each linear equation actually represents a plane, right? So each, each equation represents a plane. So let's say we have uh, alpha 1, 1, x1 plus alpha 1, 2, x2 plus alpha 1, 3, x3 equals b1. And this is going to represent a plane now. So I'm just going to try to draw a plane. You can imagine that as any plane you want. <laughs> it's not, not the greatest picture. And then we have another plane. So we, we're going to have two equations in three-dimensional space, all right? So this is going to be alpha 2, 1, x1 plus alpha 2, 2, x2 plus alpha 2, 3, x3 equals b2. All right, so this is going to be some other plane, right? maybe intersect somehow. Um, as long as they're not parallel planes, right, then they will intersect, but how are they gonna intersect? So two planes are gonna intersect along a, an entire line, right? So the solution set is either gonna be a line or the planes are gonna be parallel, all right? And so, in, in other words, there's still gonna be infinitely many solutions, right? So the two possibilities here are infinitely many solutions if it's consistent so if there is a solution if it's consistent there's going to be infinitely many solutions or there's not going to be any solutions right so if the two planes are parallel then we're going to have no solutions but it's impossible to get one single solution for an underdetermined system that's why it's called underdetermined there's not enough information so again no solutions would look like you have two parallel planes right that never touch so two parallel planes would give you no solutions in this three-dimensional setup that we've that I've imagined here.
All right, so that's an underdetermined system. So underdetermined can have, if consistent, it has infinitely many solutions. All right, and it could still be inconsistent though, right? All right, the last possibility is that maybe we have too much information. So an M by N system is said to be overdetermined. So it's overdetermined if this time if N is greater than M. So uh, sorry, <laughs> if n is less than m. So if m, m is greater than n. If there's more equations, then there are unknowns. I'll write it in the same order we had up here. So if you flip, flip the symbol, right, if m is greater than n. So in this case, uh, here's an example. Let's suppose we have three equations in two-dimensional space, right? So let's go back to our two-dimensional example and say we have three equations. So maybe we have alpha 1, 1, x1 plus alpha 1, 2, x2 equals b1 alpha 2, 1, x1 plus alpha 2, 2, x2 equals b2, and then alpha 3, 1, x1 plus alpha 3, 2, x2 equals b3. Remember, these are all supposed to represent lines in, space, in, uh, in the plane, right? So maybe we have one line looks like this, and another line looks like this. And so far, so good, right? That's great. Um, but what if the third line looks like this. Well, these lines all intersect each other pairwise, but they don't intersect in a common point, right? So it's possible to get no solution because, because of this setup right here, right? You could have too much information. Like in other words, if you take any two of them together, you'll find a solution, uh, but there's not a solution where all three of the lines intersect in a single point. All right, now it is still possible to get a single solution in this case. It would just have to be something like, the geometry would have to look something like this, right? Where all the lines intersect in a single point. Or again, if they all kind of lie on, the, all the equations represent the same line and they all kind of just lie on top of each other. So you can still get one solution or infinitely many solutions in this case. Uh, but for overdetermined systems, you every for every equation that you add of extra information, extra criteria, you run the risk, right? of getting a situation like this. So the possibility of an inconsistent system, so no solution, increases as you add as you add equations to your system. All right? So um, we'll leave it here. That's just mostly just some vocab and a little bit of a way to visualize these equations at the end. But the most important things that we've done in this lecture here today our work through and talk about uh, Gauss and Gauss Jordan Gaussian and Gauss Jordan elimination, um, which really encapsulates everything that we worked out from the very beginning of this lecture. So I'm going to leave this one here, and I will see you guys in the next one.